Hey everyone, in this video, as part of our Dangerous Persuasion Weapon series, we are going to cover fake commonalities. There is a very high probability that any salesperson or agent in the past who told you I have this in common with you was probably lying. So what are fake commonalities? How do we defend against them? And how do we use them if we really have to? That's what we're going to cover. So let's cover how commonalities work. What usually happens is when we consider someone to be similar to us, we drop our guard. So we don't judge them as much, we don't scrutinize them as much, we don't evaluate what they're saying as much, and we trust them a lot more, even if we shouldn't. But the interesting effect, and the reason why fake commonalities work in the first place, is that the commonalities don't need to be real. That is, as long as you believe that the other person is similar to you, you are going to drop their guard. It doesn't really need to be a situation where they are similar to you, you just need to think it. Because this is a persuasion technique that is manifested only by the effect that it has on you. So as long as you have that effect, then it works. So how this is manifested in a negotiation or a persuasion situation is that we see the other person as part of our group, part of our tribe. We identify with them to a higher degree. And this results in us asking for less things, being less aggressive, being less defensive when they ask us for other things, and making concessions that we really didn't need to do just because we think that the other person is similar to us. It's important to mention that usually there are two types of commonalities that are leveraged, whether false or true, and these are traits and experiences. So first of all, traits are personality traits. This is something like saying, I'm loyal, and the person saying, I'm a loyal person as well. While experiences have to do with going through something, it's you saying that you travel to a particular country, and they say that they've done it as well. Or you say that you had a kid and it was very hard raising him because you are poor and the person says, I had that experience as well. So these are the two main types. So starting with personality traits, this is very frequent. What happens is the other person tries to find out what are the principles that you have? What are the personality traits that you really value? Are you a person that is oriented towards safety? Do you prefer adventure? Do you prefer contact with others? Are you a people person? Or are you more of a loner? So they try and figure you out and they try to distill you into a couple of principles, a couple of traits. And then the only thing that they need to do is to state that they are similar in some way. And again, this may be true or false. It's only a false commonality if they fake it in order to seem to be similar to you. So you're buying a house, for example, and you're a very logical and a very diligent person. And the real estate agent can figure this out. So what they do is they pretend to be logical and they pretend to be diligent as well in order for you to like them more because you see yourself in that person. And by the way, I did not pick this example by accident. Real estate agents are some of the best manipulators in terms of false commonalities. And naturally, I'm not generalizing. I'm just speaking from my experience. This can also be done by salespeople, by client managers, and many other positions. But at the end of the day, you figure out how the person describes themselves in terms of traits and then you claim to be a similar person. Then, with experiences, it's all about claiming that you've had a similar experience to the person. So in our previous example, if I'm trying to buy a home and the real estate agent is trying to figure me out and pretend to have a commonality, I may say something like, well, I really want my kids to be safe because when I was younger, I had to raise them, I didn't have a lot of money, and so on. And so the real estate agent says something like, oh, I really know what you went through because I had a kid as well and I was poor at the time and I just wanted to guarantee their safety. So what they do is they take an experience from your life and they claim they have a similar one. Again, this can be used in an authentic or a false manner. If you do have that experience or even if you don't have it, if you're just twisting it to a degree, it's still valid. But if you're fabricating it out of thin air, then it's a false commonality for sure. In this example, you are not pretending to be like the person, but you are pretending to have gone through the same events, the same rituals, the same experiences as they have, which is also a powerful type of commonality. And you may ask, how do we defend ourselves from false commonalities? There are usually three major techniques. The first is misdirection. That is, you give them a false trait or a false commonality and you bait them into saying that they have something in common with somebody who isn't you. The second is to scrutinize their experience. That is, when you think that that experience or trait is false, you press deeper into it. And the third type is to leverage the commonality and embrace it, but you use it against them because they're trying to use the commonality to get you to make concessions. So you embrace the commonality and you get them to make concessions. So our first technique is misdirection. 
That is, you misrepresent yourself in order to bait the person into saying that they have something in common with a person who isn't you. This is when you're trying to block the commonality. You know that they're trying to pretend they have something in common with you. They're trying to latch onto you. So you misdirect in order to make them have a commonality with someone who isn't you. So for example, if you are a startup founder or an entrepreneur and you're trying to buy something and you know that the salesperson is trying to pretend they have something in common with you, you don't represent yourself as an entrepreneur. You say, I'm just a senior employee and I don't make any of the decisions. Because then that salesperson is going to pretend to be a senior employee as well who doesn't make decisions. So if they were trying to have something in common with you, to get you to make a concession, you are nothing like that person. And then you even call them out on it. So this is something like, well, I'm a senior employee just like you, and I've gone through this experience, and I think in this following way. And then you state, well, I'm sorry, but I don't have a lot in common with you because I'm actually an entrepreneur. Maybe you understood me the wrong way. So you're kind of screwing with the other person, but what you're doing is you're effectively blocking that commonality. The second technique also aims to break the commonality. But in this case, what you do is you scrutinize what the person is saying. So let's take the exact same example. You're a startup founder or an entrepreneur, and the salesperson claims to be one as well. So what you do is, before you speak about your experience, you press them on their experience. So you say, I'm a startup founder. And the salesperson says, oh, I'm a startup founder as well. I've created multiple startups. I've co-founded them. Uh, I was an entrepreneur. We went for multiple accelerators, venture capital, whatever it is. So you press them on the experience. You ask, okay. So what were your startups about? What was the most difficult thing about this type of life? And so on. What usually happens is that when someone pretends to have a commonality, they actually know nothing about the topic. So by pressing them on it, you are breaking them in a way. It's very easy to say, I've went through this as well as a lie, but it's very hard to come up with details if you're actually lying. And one tip that you can use here is you can ask about the negative side of something. What I mean by this is the following. If I'm pretending to do something, I am possibly going to know about the positive side of it, but not the negative side. For example, if I'm pretending to be a startup founder, I'm going to know about venture capital, events, champagne, celebrations, disruption, but I'm not going to know about the negative side of it. The mental health issues, the co-founder disputes, the jealousy when other startups are selected for random events and yours isn't, and so on. So by asking about the negative side of something, it's very easy to gauge whether they actually have gone for that experience or whether they're lying. And the same for personality traits, by the way. If you're a loyal person and they tell you, oh, I'm very loyal as well, they know about the positive sides of it. Trusting people, having people that make you feel safe or secure, but they probably don't know about the negative side of loyalty. Staying loyal, even with people that abuse you or that treat you in a manner that is not positive or denying proof because you are so blinded by loyalty and so on. So asking about the negatives is a great way to call somebody out when they're faking a commonality. And our third technique is to embrace the commonality and use it yourself. By this, I mean the following. The first two techniques were focused on blocking the commonality. You don't want to have the commonality so that the person doesn't use it against you. This third technique is the opposite. You want to embrace the commonality, which you want to use it against the person. Because think about it. What is the goal of having a commonality in persuasion or sales? Well, the person wants you to identify with them so that you make more concessions. So what you do is you embrace the commonality and you expect the other person to make concessions because they identify with you. This is a very interesting principle because what you're doing is you see them coming a mile away, you know the technique that they're going to be using, you let them use it, and then you use it against themselves. So what you end up doing is something like this. The person says, oh, you seem like you're a very loyal person. I'm a very loyal person as well as a salesperson. And immediately you say something like, oh, we have so much in common. I expect that I'm going to get a discount or that you're not going to negotiate that much against the person who has so much in common with you. And this is such a twisted, but such an effective technique because they're expecting you to make concessions because you have something in common. But what you're doing is you're saying, yes, we have something in common and you're the one who is going to make a concession because of it. This is the equivalent of in martial arts, you know that the other person is trying to grab you into a clinch, a close proximity stance, and instead of avoiding it and trying to fight from a distance, you are the first one to go in, embrace them, and then you attack them from the clinch. It's kind of a violent analogy, but it's exactly how it works. Instead of keeping your distance, you know that they want to embrace you and fight in close range, so you embrace them first and you fight even more in close range. And our next question is, how do we use pretend commonalities if we really need to? So what you need to realize is that this is a gray area. 
Nobody has 100% something in common with a person, and nobody is the complete opposite of a person. This may occur in very rare cases, but it's usually not the norm. So what happens is, you need to be the one to decide how much you want to pretend that you have a commonality. So in my opinion, commonalities are best leveraged after what I call the diagnostic phase. That is, you ask a lot of questions about the person, their needs, their goals, what they're looking for, how they do things, and after that type of conversation, you really do a diagnostic of the person. You know exactly what they want, you know exactly what they stand for, and you also know exactly what they don't want. And this type of granularity allows you to pretend or to identify a commonality more effectively. So for example, if you know that a person is looking for a product because they want peace of mind, their life has been very turbulent, and they just want a safe space, you probably know that safety, peace of mind, stability, and so on are some of their top values. And this is the part where you ask yourself, hey, do I really have any sort of security or safety as one of my top values? And do I leverage that? Or am I going to pretend to have it? In my opinion, it's best not to pretend at all, for one reason, which is credibility. You want to have the frame of a trusted advisor, an objective recommender, and if you do anything that is motivated by your own interests, just to sell or just to get anything else, immediately that frame is broken. And once you break it, it's very hard to get it back. Once the person knows that you don't want to help them, that you're not objective, and that you're just trying to push something, it's very hard to come back from that. That's why, in my opinion, it's a lot better to use authentic commonalities. And you can stretch things a little bit, right? Maybe if one of your top values is not security, but maybe it is when you're talking about your kids or talking about your career, then you do have a component of it, right? You're not lying when you say that you actually seek security in some areas. But if you're actually lying and you are nothing like this person, then that is a big problem. And another problem is that when you are lying, unless you're a very good liar or a sociopath by nature, that's going to be noticeable in your subcommunication. That is, if you're trying to say something that you don't really believe, then your body is going to show it. You're going to become a little bit clunky, you're going to hesitate, maybe you are going to sweat bullets, or some other type of body symptom, if you will. So when you lie, that's going to be manifested in some way. Again, unless you are very experienced at it. So that's why I would recommend that if you have a commonality, even if it is a small one, then maybe you can augment it and you can play with it a little bit. But don't fabricate one out of thin air because it's going to be noticeable. So this is how fake commonalities work. By identifying more with the other person, we drop our guard, we make less concessions, and we fight less for ourselves in a way. And this is the type of technique that is only manifested by the effect that it has on the person. In other words, even if the commonality is fake, if the person ever realizes it, it's exactly the same as an authentic one. Then, there are three major techniques that I recommend to defend against false commonalities. The first is misdirection. You tell them something wrong, you wait until they pretend they have a commonality with that something wrong, and then you tell them, you don't have anything in common with me. The second is to catch them in a lie, to scrutinize their life experience. Oh, you say that you've been an asset manager? Then tell me about your experience, and especially about the negative parts of it, because someone who is lying is going to know about the positives, but never the negatives. The third technique is a little bit different from the two other ones. You don't want to block the commonality, you want to embrace it and you want to do exactly what the other side wants to do. You want to get them to drop their guard and to make concessions, and you tell them this explicitly. And finally, if you have to leverage a commonality yourself, wait until the end of the diagnostic phase, because you're going to know everything about the person's needs, their goals, and what they stand for. You can play a little bit with your current commonalities, but I would not recommend fabricating one, because you are going to be caught one way or the other. If you've enjoyed the video, consider liking and subscribing and don't forget to check out the channel for more communication, negotiation, and persuasion techniques. Thank you for watching.